Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Women Empower Active, a project to help women reach their fitness goals through sharing information and discussing obstacles which often snag all of us in our pursuit of active, healthy lifestyles. I'm Amy Moritz, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, a little housekeeping, please follow along on Twitter at UR Sportswear and tweet any questions or comments that you have uh, today for our guests using the hashtag StrongWomen. Uh, we always encourage your questions here, and uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can uh, while we're on the air. Today, so excited, our guest is Fawn Dorr, a track and field athlete, pro track and field athlete, who competes in the 400 hurdles, uh, and has had to refocus mentally and come back after uh, missing making the 2012 Canadian Olympic team. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how you bounce back mentally. And Fawn, welcome to uh, Women Empower Active. Hi, how's everybody doing? Great. Uh, so yes, thanks so much. And and if you could start by telling us a, a little bit how you got into into sprinting because you have a distance running background. So so tell us how you got into elite racing and and how you evolved into a sprint and a hurdler. Well, um, I started running track and field. I actually started running cross country out of a dare in middle school. Somebody dared me to join the team, and I was like, fine. I was this dorky, scrawny, you know, insecure little kid, and I started running cross country, and I was actually fairly good at it. Uh, so me and my coach were really, really close in high school, and she asked me what my goal was, and I told her I wanted to run in the Olympics, and I was in seventh grade. And she's like, oh, you're, you want to run in the Olympics? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so ever since then, uh, I, I was running long distances. I was a miler. I ran the 2,000-meter steeplechase in high school. Um, and I suffered a series of um, traumatic head injuries when I was in high school that caused me to develop a epileptic disorder. And um, I had more problems with the condition when I was running longer events, the 5K uh, and, and 2,000 meter steeple. So we found that I had less problems when I dabbled in the 800 meter and the 400 meter hurdles. And so uh, since I couldn't run a fast 400 and I knew how to steeple, they were just kind of like, oh, well, we'll throw you in the 400 hurdles and hope that works out. And it kind of did. Um, I went to SUNY Cortland University, which is a really small D3 school in, uh, just outside of Syracuse, New York. And um, I was D3 national champion there in the 400 meter hurdles. I ran 59.5, I believe. And after that year, I transferred to Penn State University, where I became an 11 time All American and just stuck to the 400 and 400 meter hurdles. I pretty much ran anything my coach told me to run, but uh, my best events were the 400 and, and the four hurdles. So ever since then, I've just been. A sprinter, you know, I, I wanted to be a world-class miler. I, I looked up to Alan Webb and, and Carrie Tullifson, and I thought they were just the coolest, but it turned out that that wasn't for me. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I had to make the Olympic team, and I was unrelentless. I didn't care which event it was. Whatever I had to do to get there, that's what I was going to do. And we have a question that, that came in from Twitter, um, um, because you attempted to... Uh, you, uh, the Canadian Olympic team. So how hard was it or was it difficult to, to switch um, from U.S. system to Canadian system? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it was very difficult for me emotionally. There's a, a stigma that comes with athletes that change countries. Now, it, I'm how, people ask me all the time how I'm actually a Canadian. The truth is that my mother is Canadian. Um, she's not American. And my father is American. I was born in the United States. I was born in New York. Um, and I lived half of my life from May to September of every year of my childhood um, in northern Ontario, Canada, in a little place called uh, Tamagami, which is about an hour north of North Bay. So um, I lived in Canada in the summer, and I just went to school in New York. Uh, my parents would take me out of school early. But what happened was um, I was an American until 2012, just before the Olympics. It took me about a year to become to go through all the processes. You have to be released by the I, um, IAAF uh, to become a different country member. 
Um, and it took a, it did take a long time. Um, I became a Canadian officially about a month and a half, I think, um, maybe two, before the Olympic trials. Um, and it made me look really, really bad. So it made me look like I had just switched countries um, because the American team is so difficult to make. Um, and the Canadian team isn't doesn't have the depth that the American team has. Um, and those, and that's true, you know. Um, People forget that I got third at a USA Championship in 2010. So there's, there was also a possibility that I could have made a USA team. Now, there are multiple reasons why um, I became a Canadian, but one of them is for a greater opportunity, uh, opportunity for money, an opportunity for races, exposure, um, a lot of things that go into it. And I had to take the you know, the backlash of it. A lot of things that went on um, on the internet, a lot of blogs, a lot of awful things people were saying about me, and I had to deal with all of that uh, just before the Olympic trials, which is hard enough by itself. Um, I was also told that before the Olympic trials uh, there were certain people that were protesting my racing. I had sat out of the USA Indoor uh, National Championships um, because I felt it would look bad if I were to run for the U.S. and then six months later I'm running for Canada. <laughs> so I sat out, but uh, despite that, um, I had coaches and, and certain athletes protesting my, my competition at, at the Canadian trial. So I was dealing with a lot. I didn't know anybody. Um, I became friends with so many U.S. athletes, and some of them are still you know, some of my really good friends today. Um, actually, Dwayne Solomon was texting me today, <laughs> just before this inter interview, and you know, I'm I'm friends with a lot of people from a lot of different countries, but it was a hard time. It's it's very lonely after you leave the um, the collegiate world. It becomes very very lonely, and I think that was a hard time for me. And, and how how did you have to deal with? It? How did you end up dealing with that? Um, e e emotionally, because you had that going on, and then you have the disappointment too of of not making not making the team. Um, when I tell you that it was like traumatizing, it absolutely was. Uh, I was scared to go on, like literally afraid to go onto any social network. Um, my Facebook is private. I only keep that to my family and my close friends. But my Twitter, my Instagram, those kinds of things are, are open to everyone. Um, so after I had lost um, the Olympic trials, I you know just walked off the track and I told my coach, I'm like, can like I I need to try it again. Like let me let me try it again. You know, give give me another shot. And uh, like I can do it. Just let me let me run again. I I, I wasn't. I couldn't believe that it was over, that the dream, you know, was over, and the crowd was chanting somebody else's name. Um, it was the first time in my career that I felt defeated. I've lost hundreds of races. I've won hundreds of races. Though wins and losses, they come and go. But being actually defeated is something much bigger than that it changes you permanently. It makes you look at yourself differently. It makes you walk differently. It makes you feel differently. And it, it really traumatized me. So after the race, you know, I, I told my, like I was, I was just in complete shock, like I had just watched a car wreck, you know. And um, I told my coach, get, you know, get me out of here. Whatever you got to do, you got to get me out of here. And so we left the track, and I quick tweeted, to my fans who I, I significantly really, really care about. I really have a close relationship with my fans and I felt awful. I felt like I had embarrassed my coach. I felt like I had let them down. And so I tweeted, you know, I failed you, basically. And I shut my phone off and um, I, didn't, I didn't turn my phone back on for another two and a half months. I didn't talk to my family. I didn't talk to my friends. I didn't watch TV because I couldn't bear not only that the Olympics was on TV and I wasn't there, um, but that uh, there's Olympic commercials and you know Olympic music and you constantly hearing different uh, national anthems and I just couldn't I couldn't bear it. So I pretty much became a hermit. I was extremely depressed. Um, 
I, I was embarrassed. I couldn't even go because in where I was training, I was training at Penn State at the time. Um, athletes are like celebrities there. And so I couldn't even go to the Olive Garden. Or I remember one time I went to Red Lobster maybe a week or two after that. And, um, and I couldn't even handle going to Red Lobster because the, the waiter knew who I was and asked me about running and I was like, yo, we need to get out of here, you know, so I got up and I, and I left the restaurant, things like that. It's like, it was, it was, people don't realize that you define, as an athlete, sometimes you define your own self-worth by your performance. Just because I had lost didn't mean that I was a bad person, it didn't mean that I was a failure, you know, but it's something that, that even as an athlete, in the, we don't see the big scheme of things. We don't see the things that really, really matter. All we see is that loss. And so that's what I mean by it defeated me. Um, I, was, I wasn't myself for a long, long time. And I would drive up to the track. Um, I, I told my agent to pull me out of all the races that he had put me in that summer. I told him I'm not racing anymore this summer. I can't do it. Um, I would go up to the track and I would sit there and uh, on this hill that we park on and I would look at the track and I would tell you know my significant other that I was going to practice, and I would just sit in my car for a couple hours, and I would never get out. You know, I would I would, I would have my bag ready. I just I just couldn't get out there. So it took me a good three months to be able to look at myself in the mirror, to be able to look at a pair of running shoes. And you know, one time I was sat down by a close friend, um, a person that I was dating, and they said, you know, you have to make a decision, either. You have to let it go. You have to put your shoes on. <laughs> and I could cry right now thinking about it. You have to put your shoes on and go out there and just, just run. Or you have to tie your laces together and hang them up for good. So, you know, make a decision and stop this, this limbo. Either you're going to get over yourself and stop feeling bad for yourself you know, turn your phone back on, turn the TV back on, put your shoes on, or, or let it go. And, you know, it was just one of those things where I just, just like that, I was like, okay, you know, I'm done mourning the loss, not just of that race, but the loss of the person that I was before that race. I had to recreate myself, and I had to, I had to learn to love myself again and learn to believe in myself again. And that was something that was really hard to do, but the first thing I had to do was tie up my laces, you know, one step at a time. So that's what I did. And, you know, building off of that, we have a, a, qu a couple questions that, that have come in from Twitter, and, and Kara wants to know, how, how did that experience, a after you kind of went through that mourning period, did it motivate you? Did it, did it drive you at, at all when you were planning your next goals? Or was that maybe something that, that you then forgot about? Um, I don't think you ever forget about something like that. Like I said, it was traumatizing and it changed me. It's like I've always compared running to a relationship. So the relationship that I had with running, I still have one, but it's a different one. This is a new relationship that I have. And that one was an old, it was an old significant other, you know? So I had to, I had to learn to love again. And in that way, I had to also learn to let go of a love that I used to have. Um, just like you would if you, were, if you were dating somebody. You know, you can't fully be invested in a new relationship and a new outlook if you're still holding on to your loves of the past. So that's, you know, that's what I did. And I'll never forget it, and I'll never regret it. Um, and it taught me a lot about myself. But it's something that both hurts me still and, and motivates me still. I remember reading about this one swimmer, this Olympic swimmer, who um, touched the wall at the Olympic final, and he turned around quick to see the clock, you know, to see who had won, and the guy in the lane next to him erupted, screaming, you know, super excited because he had won. And he had that scream of his competitor's um, joy recorded and he would use it as his alarm every morning when he got up to go to practice that scream he'd hear every morning when I tell you that when I crouch down in my blocks I don't hear my own name sometimes I hear them screaming somebody else's name the person who had won and 
and I hear the crowd and I and I I envision that and I feel it. And I'm a different athlete now in that same old situation. And so I use that, you know, to motivate me. I, I do use that um, because I could never, I, can, I can't go through that twice. I refuse to go through that twice. And so now every day I practice, you know, when I get to the point where I'm, I'm breaking down, my body's breaking down, I feel like I can't do it anymore, I start to hear, I hear those same noises. I hear the, that repetition. Sometimes it hurts my feelings. And sometimes it gets me through a workout. What is that new relationship that, that you have now with, with running? Well, one, I take running with a bit of a grain of salt at this point. I know that at the end of the day, if, if, if I die and I go to meet my maker, whoever my ma maker may be is not going to ask me how fast I run a 400-meter hurdle run. At this point, running has to be more than winning. I can't tell you how many times I've won, and I can't tell you how many times I've lost. Running has to be, once you get to an elite status, that it has to be about something more than winning. You have to run with a purpose. You know, you have to run with, your wins have to mean something to you and, and to other people, to your fans and to your family and, and your friends. And I think that's where I'm at now, that... A lot of times I, was, I would speak to some of my best friends about it that after the Olympic trials, I chose not to give up and try it one more time, not just for myself, but for every person that has ever given up on something. And I remember like crying thinking about that, like I can't give up, you know, because how many times have I told my fans, don't give up? How many times have I told them, you know, you're better than you think you are? Or how many times have I told my fans, you know, that... If you just if you just don't stop trying, you just you just get get up and dust yourself off. And if I couldn't listen to my own advice, I would be a phony. I would be a, I would be a fake. So sometimes it's my own advice that's <laughs> that's hard to listen to. You know, it's hard to it's hard to accept. And um, there were times where I was like, man, I hate I hate that I tweet these things sometimes because I read back through them and I'm like, now I have to like hold myself accountable <laughs> by my own advice, but. Uh, so sometimes even my fans and and um, my tweets and my promises to my fans, those are really, they get me through practice sometimes. So it, it changed how I felt about how I felt about my fans, especially after the Olympic trials. They were so supportive um, during a time when I was really broken. And that meant a lot to me. Um, people would write me emails and say small, you know, 140 characters. It's crazy how much 140 characters can, you know, really uplift your day. People forget that just because I'm giving inspiration and I'm, and I'm motivating people doesn't mean that I don't need that sometimes. I'm still human and I'm, I'm not made out of steel. You know, things hurt my feelings. So I think that it was a, it was a time where I learned to fall in love with my fans again and I learned to fall in love with the process um, and even in the process, even the failures that come with that sometimes. So I think that's what I had to do to, you know, to get over it. We have a, another question in from, from Twitter from Chris who wants to know what your fondest memory of running at Penn State was. Oh, my gosh. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think that I was so close with my teammates when I was in college. Um, we were, you know, a very, a very different breed. And uh, I think my coach, who now is the sprint, uh, the women's sprint coach at the University of Arkansas, Chris Johnson, um, he would probably say the same thing um, that they he would always tell us they don't make athletes like you guys anymore, you know. And I think that um, it was really my team dynamic that I was in love with. Um, but I think that one of my fondest moments was uh, probably regional championship in, uh, what year was this? I want to say 2009. Um, it was at uh, North Carolina a t which is a beautiful track, by the way, if you've never seen it. Um, but I was uh, third, or, no, I was anchor. I was anchor leg, and I received the baton. I think the next, I think the first two teams, the top two teams went on to national championships, um, NCAAs, and I got the baton in like, oh my God, it was like fourth or fifth place. It was awful. We were doing awful. Um, and I 
knew that if our relay team didn't make it, one of potentially one of my other teammates wouldn't be at the national championship with us. And I ran like a bat out of hell. Um, I ran the first 200 meters. I was probably like 23 high. <laughs> you know, it was just madness. I went from from fifth to um, fifth to shoulder to shoulder with first um, by 200 meters, and then. Um, I felt the burn at 210, which is <laughs> for a 400 meter. Uh, that's way too early. <laughs> um, but I just all I could think of that last home stretch. I remember seeing the um, the Megatron, and I could see myself, you know, running that shoulder to shoulder with the girl next to me. And all I could think uh, in my brain was, hold your form together. Like whichever one of you breaks first, breaks form first, is going to lose. So that's all I thought the last 100 meters was just hold your form, hold your form. And I'm sure it looked horrendous. I'm sure it looked awful. But, um, you know, I ended up crossing the finish line, and, and Penn State won, and it really, um, it really put me on the map. People really started watching me at, after that point, after that year. You know, and we, you know, we mentioned that, that you've done, you, you had done some distance training, but, you know, or very, very early on, and, and, and you're running. And, and we've talked to a lot of distance athletes on here. When you're talking about training, for sprinting, what 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 are the differences? What what's different, and how is your training going right now? Well, um, and it's so strange because a lot of sprinters probably wouldn't have this perspective. Um, me coming from a long distance uh, base is really extreme. Usually, athletes go the opposite way. Uh, they go to uh, longer events as opposed to shortening down. But for me, um, a lot of things are the same, and a lot of things are different. Distance running, I find that all the mental work comes in the race. You're constantly pushing against pain. You're constantly pushing against your own um, mental demons telling you to run slower, that you can't hold the pace, that, you know, this person's coming for you, blah, 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 blah. Where sprinting is actually the opposite. All the mental work is done at practice. Um, you're thinking about how many steps you take. I take 23 to the first hurdle, 15 to the second. You know, you're thinking about uh, lifting my knee, the positioning of my arms. You're all these things that you're thinking about. And then when you get in a race, it all turns off. Your body just goes to uh, to to machine mode. And distance running is actually kind of the opposite than that. Um, at least I found in my experience. That being said. Um, when I was a 5K cross-country runner in high school, I started a mantra that probably around two miles, um, when it would start to hurt, I would tell myself, this is who I am, and this is what I do, and this is what I love. And I would convince myself, and when I say this, I'm not referring to running. I'm referring to the pain that I'm in, to the, to the hurt that my body is in, that that's what, I, that's what I do this for, that's what I love. And it came to the point where I would actually convince myself that is, that is something that I would like and that the race didn't start until it started hurting and so even though I did that as a distance runner I still do that now at practice when I can't get through something when something is really really difficult and I'm hurting and my coach is yelling at me to get to the line and you know to start I tell myself that this is who I am and this is what I do and this is who I love and 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 what I love and um, and sometimes it brings me brings me through the same way that it did when I was, you know, 12, 15, 16 years old. Some things never change. Kara uh, from Twitter wants to know what your plans are, what you're planning for 2016. Um, well, I have already started the countdown in my brain. Um, the next Olympics is, it's my time. Everybody has a time, and I have decided, and and, and chosen that this time is mine. And it starts today. It starts yesterday. It started this year. It started when I lost in 2012 that, and, and decided to give it one more shot, that this is what I planned to do. You know, I moved across the country. I moved to South Carolina. Then I moved to Atlanta. And, I, and now I'm training with the, uh, the Toronto East Hub training group in, in, in Canada. And I'm here in, in St. Kitts in the West Indies at the, at the moment doing warm weather training. And if, if you were to talk to my teammates, they would tell you that every day I come to practice is race day. Today is Rio. Today is the 2016 Olympics. I have to think that way every day so that when I get into the blocks and I get into the situation where the 
I'm at the trials or I'm, I'm in Rio. I've already ran that race a thousand times. I've ran it thousands of times at practice. Every time I get into my blocks, I hear the crowd and I, and I, feel, I feel the heat and I, I, I just know that this has to be, has to be my time. No one can, can want this more than me. No one can be a bigger fan for me than me, and nobody can motivate me more than me. I take complete control of the of this entire situation and every situation that I've had since the previous since the previous uh, Olympics. I think that back then um, I would occasionally consider myself to be like victimizing myself. I was a victim of my circumstances, and now I refuse to be a victim of any circumstance. I'm. I think you you actually tweeted one of my. I refuse to uh, accept the things that I cannot change. Instead, I'm changing the things that I cannot accept. And that's, uh, that's my mentality going into Rio. You know, as we, uh, w women who watch um, us here and, and are connected with us are at all levels. Some are elite. Some are just, you know, trying to get through their first, you know, neighborhood 5K or just commit to, to, to doing something healthy. As someone who's gone through a lot of ups and downs, What's your advice to, to women who, when, when, when they have that, that setback, which may not be as, you know, hugely devastating, but, but, but to them it might be really difficult to, to come back from? Well, I think that, okay, you know, if you have, if you develop a stress fracture, we'll just use that as an example. If, you, if, some, if an average runner develops a stress fracture, it's devastating. Your stress fracture hurts just as much as my stress fracture. Just because I'm an elite athlete doesn't mean that I'm so much different than you. It's just different, different races and, and different lighting, right? So 100% effort on my part is the same as 100% effort on your part. And in a way, I almost respect the, uh, the, the hobbyist runner or the average runner um, more than the elite runner. There's a reason I'm going out. It has to do with money, and it has to do with experience, and you know, whatever, and accountability. My, somebody yelling at me every day. If I if I didn't get up and go to practice, my coach would be pounding on my door, and I'd get in big trouble. No one's doing that to regular people. No one's pulling you and tying your shoes for you and getting you ready to go. No one's giving you a massage when you're hurting. No one's running your ice tub for you. I respect people that that run on their own accord, because it then it's a conscious decision. It's not a job. This is much different when it's a job. For someone who experiences setbacks, it's the same for, for you and maybe even more difficult for you than it is for me because it's a job for me and it's a passion or a love for somebody else. First and foremost, I think that taking care of your body from a doctor's standpoint is always the most important. But before you get any sort of surgery or you know something really invasive, Play with doctor opinions. Change your shoes. Change your iPod. You know, change your change your sports bra. <laughs> if you have to, sometimes, and I have a hard time doing this. Um, sometimes it's good to take rest. I have a hard time doing that. I train six times a week, and when we on two days a week, we have like um, a light day. I don't like light days because all I can think about is the last Olympic team that I didn't make, and I need to work, 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 work. What we forget is that a part of our working is not working. A part of our, our running is not running. Running is a 24-hour job. It's the way you eat. It's the way you sleep. It's the way you rest. It's when you, it's, and then it's when you run. It's, it's not just pavement and shoes. It's, it's a lot more than that. So you got to give yourself a break. You know, Sometimes you got to just take a deep breath and, and let it go. The other day I had an awful workout of practice. I mean awful. And it was the first time I've had an awful workout since I've been here, and I've been here since November. So I, I, I pretty much just was like, you know what? This was a really cruddy workout. My teammate was like, Fawn, you've been here for two months, and you've had one bad workout. She's like, get over yourself. Let it go. And I was like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> Why am I beating myself up? You know, <laughs> bad things happen. Injuries happen. It's not something that we fight. It's a part of the sport. Injuries and and soreness and tiredness and unfortunate events. That's a part of the sport. You have to embrace it as much as you embrace your, your good workouts, as much as you embrace you know, the, the joy of running. You have to accept 
that it's not always so joyful. To get through it, you just got to stop beating yourself up, try your best to recover, and the next day when you wake up, you got to go at it like it never happened. You got to brush it off and pretend like it really never happened. And after a couple days, you'll probably forget that it did. Great. Well, Fano, I want to thank you so much for for joining us. This has been it's it's been a pleasure to talk with you and and I know you have lots of you know, inspiration uh, and motivation that, that you put um, on, on your Twitter feed. Is, is there any last thing that, that you want to, to leave our, our viewers with? Well, um, I hope that everybody has a really, really great season and um, that everyone can find their own motivation as much as I love that everybody goes to my Twitter and um, looks at, at the motivational things I say. I hope that you become your own motivation because no one, no one should want this more than you. Great. Thank you so much. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you all for, for watching and um, join us next time. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. It was nice talking to everyone. Bye-bye.